last time with the grid layout reminded me of something that's important that I want to talk about. And that is the issue of browser compatibility. Now that we're getting into using CSS for a lot more, um, there runs a risk of doing something that works on one browser but not the other. All right? Um, I suppose that's always a risk, but when you're doing really simple things, there's probably a lot less of a chance of it. But when you start using some newer features of the language, and by the language I mean both CSS and HTML, and when you start doing more involved things, there's always a risk that there's going to be something that works in one browser and not in another. Why is that? Why is there browser compatibility issues? Why are there browser compatibility issues? First off. Because browser defaults are different, possibly. Because they're all run by different companies. Right, because they're all written by different companies. And plain devil's advocate here, but there is a standard, right? HTML is a standard that tells you exactly how you should do everything. So why, um, why are there differences then if there's a standard that ought to be followed? Number one, the standard sort of evolves, and it's not as though browser manufacturers wait for a standard to be completed and set in stone before they start making enhancements. For example, you know, HTML5 evolved over a certain period of time where they were, where they were issuing new stuff all the time. And browser makers release their browsers on their own schedule for whatever reasons they have. Uh, could, they could be fixing a security issue, and so they release a new version of it. And therefore, they might not have addressed some of the newer features in, in the, the language or the specification. The other reason, quite frankly, is people that make browsers are human just like you. So it's possible they didn't do something right. Uh, when you consider all the different ways that you can, all the different stuff that you can put on a web page, and all the different combinations of stuff that you can put on the web page. It's astronomical. There's bound to be certain circumstances which were never tested for and therefore maybe has results that aren't what you want. Now, I said this in reference, the example that we had last time of this related to the CSS grid uh, that we looked at. Apparently there's a setting in Chrome that, that dictates whether it's used or not. Uh, do remember, though, you can't really count on your users doing anything, right? Because each user is different. Each user has a different level of expertise and may set their browser whatever way they feel like it. But this is the page as viewed in Chrome. And this is a page as viewed in Microsoft Edge. I wish I'd have just kept calling it Internet Explorer, but I think so many people had such bad experiences with Internet Explorer that they changed the name. I don't know. And I can't drag and drop it. In this case, the page in Edge is correct, and in Chrome, it's not correct. It's not the way that we had intended which, again, is unfortunate. A lot of times, by the way, it's the other way around. The Microsoft products tend to lag a little bit behind on implementation of HTML5 and CSS. Maybe they've caught, caught up now. But I guess the point that I have is, ideally, we would want our pages to look the same across browsers. That would be our goal. However, I would suggest don't be too attached to that goal. As long as it is workable in other browsers, that might be good enough. So let's say this is the layout we want. All right, it's a nice layout. It's the way we want it to be. In Google Chrome, it looks like this. Okay? Not quite as good as the other layout, but you know what? It's workable. It's not like it's broken. That's the nice thing about HTML and CSS compared to uh, more complete programming languages. In other programming languages, if 
you write some code that is incomprehensible to the compiler, it just blows up, right? It just can't do anything. If you say, you know, x equals y equals z or something like that. If you did that in Visual Basic or C Sharp or whatever or JavaScript, it's going to say, I don't know what that means. And it's going to blow up, right? If you write a statement that doesn't make sense. However, in HTML and CSS, it kind of guesses at what it thought you meant. So if you, uh, and by that I mean it falls back on the defaults and, and so on. So, you, you know, you always have that dilemma if you have something that doesn't work in one browser and works in another. One of it, one of the ways you could do it is try to come up with a solution that works across all browsers. That would be one option, all right? Try to come up with one solution that works across all browsers. You know, that sort of is the ideal, right? And I don't know, if I did some research, maybe there's something I could do to make that happen in this case, but uh, I don't want to devote the time to that, all right? If I absolutely couldn't get it to work, and I absolutely wanted the layout to be like this on all devices, Maybe I'd switch and I'd do a floating layout instead, okay? Because I know I can get the floating layout to work in all browsers and get it the way that I want it to, to be, all right? So either put some, there's some things called hacks that you can do where if you make a little change to your CSS, it will work across browsers. You see that all the time. Uh, little, little tiny fixes that account for browser incompatibilities. Uh, or you could redo your CSS to make it work under both browsers by taking a, a bigger approach, like changing the style of the layout you're going to have. What I'm suggesting is that one option is to say, well, it looks different, but that's okay. All right? Uh, again, as long as it's workable. Now, if this was really ugly and the things overlapped each other and it was really tough to read or whatever, then obviously you couldn't take that approach but it, it is it's it's fair game to say okay this page looks this way in this browser I want it to look this way but hey at least this way is workable all right uh, if you notice it works right in Firefox and it doesn't work right in Internet Explorer I'm very surprised with Chrome on this one all right, because usually uh, I've had the least issues with Chrome and Firefox. But again, maybe it was the way that it was installed on this machine. Maybe the default installation uh, would take care of that. That would be a good question to try. All right, so how do you know if something doesn't work on a browser? Well, one of the things to do is to test it across as many browsers as possible. All right, and... That can be a challenge, all right? Um, because not only do you want to test across browsers, you want to test across versions of browsers, all right? So you might want to, really, you should test across an old version of Chrome and a new version of Chrome, an old version of Edge and a new version of Edge, and one's in the middle. Sometimes, however, you know, you have to sort of do what is practical to do, all right? Uh, one thing I do when I release a website is I tell all the people I know, pull up this website, see, if, see how it looks. It's not a very elegant solution, but the assumption is, is that, I, that if I ask enough people, they have enough combinations of browsers and, and uh, platforms that I can thoroughly test it. But really, you should test across different platforms. That means test on a Mac with Safari and Chrome. Test on a Windows machine with Safari, Chrome, Firefox. Uh, well, I mean, there's no Safari on PCs anymore. Uh, Chrome, Firefox, Edge, Internet Explorer. And ideally test this for, for, for as many versions uh, it, as you can. In a large organization, you'd have a testing lab where you'd have machines with different things loaded. Sometimes it's an issue that you can't have two versions of the same browser on your machine. So maybe you have a machine with old versions of browsers, a machine with newer versions of browsers. All right? And test it. At some point, you have to uh, cut off 
and say, well, there's a problem in this browser, but I'm not going to address it because only a small percentage of people use that browser. All right? The hope is, however, that if it doesn't look perfect on those old, semi-obsolete browsers, at least it will be workable. There are statistics about what browsers people use, and you can accumulate them for your own website and all that. Um, I do hate when I see on web pages, which you really don't see anymore, that this, this site is best viewed with such and such browser. I think that's like amateurish. I mean, I don't think a professional site should do that. On the other hand, uh, you could drive yourself crazy trying to get things to work correctly on Netscape 1.0, right, uh, on an ancient browser. So you have to sort of balance the theoretical practice of having it work across every platform with the practical thing of, well, at a certain point, yeah, maybe it's okay to tell people to, to download a new browser. All right? Uh, there are probably statistics on browser usage. Browser usage. This is really difficult to get accurate information on, you know, because it's the World Wide Web. You know, any website's only going to get a sample of the people that visit their site, right? So it might be good to look at that. This says that 62% of people use Chrome. 15% uh, use Safari, 4% use Firefox, 3.7% uh, uses a UC browser. Is this for mobile? Yeah, that must have been for something. There's 71%, uh, 8, 5, and so on. You can look for trans... Still, you might say to yourself, 2% of people use Opera, for example. Um, well, if it doesn't work in Opera, is that a big deal? Well, would you, wonder, would you create a store that 2% of the people couldn't shop in for whatever reason? Because they drove the wrong kind of car or something like that. No, you would want to literally accommodate everyone that you can. And so therefore, it's worth checking out across browsers. There's a nice website, uh, I'm going to Google the name just to be absolutely sure. Called Can I Use? That shows based on certain functionality that's available in HTML5 and CSS3, uh, if you can use it. Oh, look at this. Fire Flexbox, which we'll be talking about today, and CSS Grid are the two top choices. So let's pick CSS Grid. And if you notice, the dark green is that it is fully supported. All right? The dark green is fully supported. The light green is supported, which means that you can use it, but certain aspects of it might not work. And the red means that, and uh, it's kind of messed up. All right. Now, if you notice with Chrome uh, and Firefox, certain versions of it enabled in Chrome through the experimental web features flag, which you had mentioned last time. So we probably have version 56 or earlier of Chrome. Let's go and look. And yes, we have version 51. So someone that had the most recent version of Chrome, whatever that is, it would work on there. In fact, anyone with version 57 and earlier would have that. Now, the one thing that I do not see here, oh, you have to hover over it to see, is what percentage of people have that particular platform. So, for example, IE 6 through 9, 0.36% of people worldwide have it. It's not a very big 
amount of people. This is probably someone that bought a computer in 2008 and never updated anything on it. All right. Uh, people that use this, there's 0.818% that use that version of Fire, those versions of Firefox. So the current is the Chrome OS 11 must be updated. Oh, really? Because the yeah, grid works? It okay. If you have a Blackberry, which apparently not too many people have, and if you're using Opera Mini, if we added up all those percentages, I'm thinking it's less than, it's probably 4-ish percent and all that. In which case, 4% of the people, what this is telling us is 4% of the people are going to see it like this. I guess I'm okay with that as a web developer. As opposed to spending countless hours trying to come up with another solution that could have its own issues. Okay? So if you're using any sort of newer issues, you might want to check out this chart. Let's check out Flexbox. Oh, this one seems to have even bigger support. Really, only IE 6 through 9, which 0.36% of the world users, according to the stats, use it. So I'm going to be pretty comfortable that this is uh, OK. What version of IE are we have here? I don't know. There we go. We have IE eleven. So we can't even we can't even break this one on this machine. Alright? We can't even break um, Flexbox because it supports some of the ish it's part, it supports it partially uh, with some known bugs. And it will tell you what the bugs are. A lot of times, if you just Google the issue, it will tell you that as well. At any rate, browser compatibility issues uh, are there, and you ought to test. All right? You ought to test across as many browsers as you have. And I would say minimally, in this class, I would expect you to look at it in, say, three browsers. Firefox, Chrome, Internet Explorer, or if you're a Mac user, Firefox, Chrome, Safari. Um, the good news is that uh, these browsers are free, so you can download them. About the only issue that you can run in is you usually can't install more than one version of a browser. I think in some cases you can, but sometimes you can. I guess it depends on the browser. So ideally, you'd check different versions. But if you're in a testing environment and you're with a large enough organization and you have like a testing center or a testing lab, that would be a consideration. Try to have machines that had different versions so you could test older and newer. Plus, again, for those features, you can always look there. All right. So next thing that we're going to look at is Flexbox, uh, using Flexbox. And that's another one I'm going to have to refer to the help because I haven't done it a lot, so I don't remember. Uh, and again, this, this shows, you know, and, and I hear people talk about in lab and this all the time, that there's so much to remember if you're an IT person, especially if you're working in complicated projects where you're doing database stuff and you're doing maybe C-sharp code and you're doing HTML code and JavaScript code and CSS code. It's okay not to know everything, all right? It's okay not to know everything. But it's one of those things that the things that you do Day in and day out, you'll remember, right? I've done floating of elements for years, all right? So therefore, if I have to float something, I can do it off the top of my head. Uh, if I have to do a flow box layout, though, yeah, I remember you can do it, and I know where to look it up. So that's almost as good as knowing it, all right? And you'll sort of evolve to that same point, too, based on the kind of stuff that you do. So let's make a copy of this. And let's go and let's do the HTML with the flow box. The idea of the flow box is sort of like this. We've talked about the flow in HTML. How, one, how block tags stack on top of each other. 
the flex, uh, I said, am I saying flow box? I think it's flex box. Yeah. Flex box sort of takes the flow and allows you to customize it a little bit. So, normally the flow is vertically. Block tag stack on top of each other. Let's Google. Let's close all these browser windows or I'll go crazy. Let's go and remove the CSS other than the body. So this effectively is using the flow layout. All right. And real quickly, I'll add a white background on it. Header, nav, section, and footer. Background of white. Now, notice something here. I do that. That looks a lot like my failed grid view, right? Well, that would be logical, right? Because if this browser doesn't understand the grid view, it's going to refer to its default, revert to its default. What is the default for laying things out? The flow layout. So this is using the flow layout, and therefore it looks like this. Now, let me go and Google Flexbox. to see what we can do with this. All right. One of the things that we can do is we can define a flex container and we can give a display of flex to it. So I'm going to go into my body. Let me rephrase that. I'm going to go into the body of the web page and say that the display of the body of the web page is flex. And what it does is it puts things side by side. Okay? So the default with the flex layout is the flow sort of changes from horizontal to vertical. No. From vertical to horizontal. Alright? So instead of being stacked vertically on top of each other, it places them side by side by side. All right? Now, how big did it make these things? It made them as big as they need to be. Right? So it made this one as wide as the word photography. It made this one as wide as the list. It made this one as wide as that. And that, it figured out to adjust it, to, to take up the rest of the space. As I make it smaller, it makes it smaller. All right. Now, that by itself, I don't know if I like it or not, but, you know, it's demonstrating what the flexible box does. Now, if I start adding widths on these things, like if I say, with 500 pixels for the header, 500 for the nav, 500 for the section, 500 for the footer. What it will do is, it still, it still figures out how to make them fit side by side. It resizes them. Now, as I get smaller, I'll make it smaller. Now, what if you don't want it to do that? What if you really want those to be 
500 wide. What you can do is you can specify what happens if that gets too big. And you can do that with the row wrap property. Let's see. I have to I have to look this up. Is it the row wrap property that I want? Or is it something else? Flex wrap property. Flex wrap wrap will cause it to wrap around. So if everything doesn't fit on one page, it will wrap it around to the next line. So notice that 500, let's change it from 500 to 400. So we have space. What it's going to do is it's going to be able to put the nav and the header side by side and the section and the footer side by side. So it does it like this. Almost another way to do the grid, right? If I make this smaller and it can't fit it in, boom, it switches to that mode. With a little bit of playing around, we can make this act and kind of give us the layout that we had before, right? We can go in here and we can make the width of the header be 100%. That's going to guarantee that it doesn't have any neighbors to the right of it, right? Because if it's 100% it's taking up all the space. Because we've said that the wrap is wrap, if it can't fit it alongside of it, it's going to wrap it around to the next line. So then I can then make Maybe the, the navigation have a width of 200 pixels. And maybe make this have a width of 50%. And maybe have this have a width of 100%. And with just a few tiny tweaks, back to this layout. But how simple is that compared to the flow or the grid or whatever? Right? It's kind of neat. And in fact, if I make this smaller, it's going to drop that down below when it can't fit it in. Is it because we specified the 200 pixel for the uh, If we change that to percentage, it would make it smaller until it couldn't make it any smaller. But again, we might have that problem of the content leaking out of it if we made it too small. Now, I can choose to stack things. That's with the property of wrap. If you don't have a property of wrap, you have the property of no wrap, which means that it will figure out how to space it. It will do its best to try to space it. Wrap reverse will put them in the opposite order. All right? So if I did wrap reverse, the footer is going to be on the top of the page, and the header is going to be at the bottom. I guess that's cool to do. <laughs> there might be a situation where you'd want to do that. Let's see some of the other things that you can do with this. You could also do things like justify the content if I want stuff centered.
You can also set the flex flow to go vertical because there's a flex direction. Justify center. You can set the flex and that would shove everything to the right. around you can give space around the lines let's see oh just as a flex with space before and after the lines let's try that that's what's great about this you don't know what it does try changing it see what it does the wrong one? Yeah, because I deleted. Yeah. I deleted that. That's the one I wanted to do. Thanks for noticing that. That, I guess, makes the space around consistent. For this one, I'm going to go with center. Align items. You can play around with this. You know how much programming I learned simply by saying, gee, I wonder if I change this from x equals 1 to x equals negative 1. And it either worked, did something I didn't expect, blew up, or whatever. So use that, you know, experiment. What's flex direction? It could either be vertical or horizontal. So I could make it either column or row. The default is, is row. So let's say flex direction. Column. of the normal flex or the top normal flow that we would have had. All right. I think that's enough to get you started on this. So you have a bunch of tools now in your toolbox for laying out the page. Let's, let's review them. Number one is you can do nothing and let the flow take control. And that sounds like a cop out, but really you can make some good designs that way. Nice, simple, one-column designs. For certain kinds of projects, that's great. All right? So you can just let the browser default of the flow take over. All right, that's option one. Option two, you can use absolute positioning. All right, where you pick a spot on the screen and nail it down. If you have a very precise layout where you want things to be exactly in certain spots, that might be the way to go. All right? Second is to use relative layouts. That's where you can adjust things based on other things on the page. There's fixed. If you want a certain piece of content to stay in the same place, regardless of how you scroll throughout the page. If you want to stay in the same place within the window as you scroll, that would be fixed. In the old days, when browsers didn't support that, it worked like absolute. So it really didn't, you know, on old browsers that didn't support the fixed property, it didn't stay in the same place, but it scrolled up with the rest of the content. Big deal. Again, because of the way CSS works and, and browsers work, 
if something isn't understood, it reverts back to a default. Okay. Another thing you can do is you can do floating layouts. Uh, and then you can do grid layouts. And then you can do flexbox layouts. So in your assignments and for your project, play around with these. Pick the one that works and pick the one that works, uh, that makes sense to do. Play around with the options. Get a design that you like and that effectively shows how you want the page to be. Now, some of these things are better for mobiles than other, for mobile devices than other. Okay? Um, when we cross platform test, we're not just cross browser testing. We should be testing in a mobile environment. All right? Now, what are your options for making a web page work both in a desk, desk, desk top and a mobile environment. Okay, that's one of the options. One of the options, and we'll talk about them, we'll talk about the, the version that we're gonna we're gonna talk about here. First of all, what is the difference when someone what are all the differences that exist when someone is browsing a website through a mobile device as compared to a desktop computer? What are the differences? Think about your own usage if you use your phone to browse the web versus using a desktop computer. What are the differences? Okay, number one, smaller screen. Mobile versus desktop. And we'll throw a laptop in there. So you're going to have probably a smaller screen. What's the other one? Or was that it? Content All right. Layout. Pardon me? Content layout. It's like a um, mobile. It's just one column. Okay. We'll, we'll get to that. Uh, so that's an implication of all these things. An implication of the smaller screen is we want a simpler layout. So, you have a touch screen instead of using mouse click. So, typically to click a link, you're going to touch it as opposed to navigate your mouse. What's the implication of that? Yeah, the hover could, could be not really useful. Uh, what else? Yeah, make them bigger, you know. I have pretty big hands and fingers, you know, how many times I click on the wrong link just by pushing it down and I click off. So maybe an implication of that is bigger link areas or, and, and more space between. Could you say different functionality too? If the hover doesn't work, you could have it so you hold it down and it pops up. Okay. Like uh, possibly different functionality for like mouse overs. One thing that that is often done on mobile sites, and I even see it on desktop now, are, are what are called hamburger menus. So I, know what, I, I never knew what they were, I knew what they were, but I never knew they were called hamburger menus until recently. Do you know what a hamburger menu is? Three lines. Three lines, yeah, where you have the bun, the patty, like this. The nice thing is, is that's becoming so much of a standard that if you see that, you pretty much instantly know what to do. And what happens, instead of the hovering, like the mouse over effect, you click on it and up pops your menu like this. So does that work both on a desktop? Sure, that works on a desktop uh, application as well as a mobile. So, all right. What's another difference between mobile versus desktop browsing? Yeah, you're likely, you're likely to have less, it's likely to be slower on a mobile device than a desktop. I don't know though, I've been times, I've been, there's been times here in, in lab where the, the internet connection is so bad 
I'm better off opening my phone and Googling it and that. So, but typically, yeah, that's a correct statement. What's the implication of that? Yeah. Figure out ways to reduce total download. And that could be through smaller images. Maybe less images. Because again, text really doesn't add up to much. So you might, you know, you'll save a little bit if you got rid of text. But if you get rid of images uh, and other uh, multimedia elements, you'll move towards that goal. All right. Another implication. For a second, don't think of the technology. Think of you as a user. What is the difference when you access something, a website, on a mobile device versus when you access it on a desktop? How many of you have visited Laurie Community College's website on a mobile device? It's like different. It doesn't look exactly the same. Okay. True, doesn't look exactly the same. What is your reasoning for accessing it on a, on a mobile device if you did access it on a mobile device? On the go, or? Don't have access to a computer. You're on the go, you don't have access to the computer. Maybe it's winter, you're driving to school, and the weather's bad, so you wonder, gee, is campus closed? No. So you <laughs> well. So you go to the website to see if there's an announcement for that. All right. So are you going to go to Elsie's website to investigate what the correct degree, degree program is for you on a mobile device or a desktop device? You're going to be more likely to visit a website that you want to spend a lot of time investigating and thoroughly reading and examining, you're more likely to do that on the desktop, simply because the fatigue of on your eyes, the, the fatigue on your hands. I get hand cramps from using the mobile phone sometimes uh, and, and doing that. But you're more likely to do that investigation on a desktop. Usually if you're going to look up something on a mobile website, your, your purpose, your goal, is going to be very pointed. You're going to have something specific. What's the phone number of LC? Because I have to call and ask him a question. All right? Uh, is the campus closed? Very pointed. What are the hours of the library, maybe? Your queries are going to be very pointed. All right? As opposed to at a desktop, you're liable to be more leisurely and taking your time. So, not only, not only is the technology different, your usage is different. Typically, when you access something on a mobile device versus a desktop device. And, Therefore, you're liable to have stripped down content. And that goes nicely with the less images, right? Maybe on a mobile device, you don't have all the nice pretty little images that pop up on the desktop version, all right? And that serves two goals, all right? One, it makes it a quicker download. Two, strip down the content because you're not there to see enjoy pretty pictures. You're there to have look up something very specific. So. As a general rule, if I'm going to generalize, a mobile site is likely to be much simpler. Maybe less content. One, one leisurely. One, one versus multiple columns. And 
and so on. All right? Now, so that sort of describes the difference in usage of mobile devices versus desktop for traveling through the web. Now, so how do we optimize our website for a mobile device? How do we make it so that the user has both a good desktop experience and a good mobile experience? There are basically three options. Option one is you had develop one CSS layout that works well for both. All right? In other words, you create your CSS layout so that, hey, this looks good on a mobile device just like it looks good on a desktop device. We got it made. Right? Now, that's possible. It's probably more likely if you're talking about simpler sites. I mean, I guess the one I think of would be like a restaurant. You know, uh, if you're talking about like a, a small mom and pop restaurant, not necessarily a chain that has a million different things and all that, but if you're talking about like just a simple restaurant, uh, you know, you might have a description of it, how to contact it, what the menu is, if there's any specials, you know, and that's about it. Might have three or four pretty simple pages. You could probably come up with a layout that would work well both for a mobile device and a desktop device for a simple site like that. Okay? Then you got it made. Your lucky day. All right? Now, when you get to more complicated things, that starts to become a problem. All right, because it's harder to take something that's more involved than to make a simple mobile version of it. So, the second option is to have multiple CSS that is switched out via, as was mentioned before, media queries. And that's what we're going to talk about. Uh, we probably don't have time to start it today, but we'll talk about that today. Remember, like since the beginning of this class virtually, I've been talking about how you can keep the HTML the same and you can change the CSS and make it look radically different. Well, this is where we're going to start really reaping the benefits of that. Because we can create multiple CSS. One that applies in a mobile situation, one that applies in a desktop situation. So we don't have to sacrifice a complicated, involved layout for a desktop device to get a simple layout for a mobile device. Yes? Um, I've used media queries before, but I've never thought about it. Can you do different images in a media query, too, like change the background, yep. stuff like that? Absolutely. Absolutely. You can apply different CSS. And you can do things like you can get rid of stuff, get rid of content, simply by setting the display property to none. All right, so it won't even display stuff. The third option is you actually make two totally different sites. If you're smart, they'll share some code, but essentially you have two different sites. And your web server, the web server again, is a program that delivers web pages when users request them. Your web server essentially has a little traffic cop inside of it. Not really an actual person, all right? But it has a little piece of code that works like a traffic cop that directs requests. It looks at the request, it can determine it's from a mobile device, it sends you to the mobile version of the page. If it sees it is from a desktop, it sends you to the desktop version of the page. You see this a lot, if you ever go to a website, 
and I can't think of any examples off the top of my head, but if you go to a website like maybe eBay, let me try it. If you go to a site like eBay, on your mobile device, okay, I lied. Let's try another one. Lied with that too. I don't know one off the top of my head, but a lot of times if you go to a website, it will redirect you to a website with an M in front of it. I, I'm not aware. I, I thought the I checked out a couple of them. I didn't find one, but M dot whatever the website is dot com. And what that is is there's actually two different websites. And when the request comes in, there's like a fork in the road. If you're this kind of device, you go to this website. If you're this kind, you go to that. There can actually be multiple forks. So not just two options. You could send to several different things. Because, again, I'm saying mobile device, but a mobile device could be a big old tablet, right, that's as big as your laptop screen, right? So you could differentiate between even different kinds of mobile devices. Uh, my brother's flip phone could have its very own website compared to someone else's smartphone. So you could actually, a low-end phone site, a medium-end phone site, a large tablet site, a desktop, a laptop. You could actually distinguish and direct people to different sites if you wanted to. All right? Another way sort of related to do this is through server-side code. Even if you have one website, you can write server-side code that makes it act like two different websites based on the kind of device it has. This is a topic of CI this is a topic of CISS 268 mobile web. This one you already know enough to do this, all right? We'll talk a little bit more about responsive pages next time to sort of frame what we've already learned from this perspective. But where we're going to spend most of our time is talking about this, uh, media queries, and writing two different, H two different CSS that you can apply to a web page. It'll make it look different in one situation versus another. All right. Any questions? All right. We'll see you over in lab. I'll unlock the door, come back, grab my files, then I'll...